Good. All right. All right. Right. And streaming live here on Zoom. Oh, Zoom has become like a second home to me. Um, and I'm sure for many of our customers as well. So here we are bringing you back to your second home, um, but this time talking about some of your favorite things in the world, your cats. Um, we have a really, really cool topic um, that we're gonna be discussing today. And uh, before we jump in, let's do a quick round of introductions. My name is Anna Skaya. I am the CEO of Base Paws. We are a cat genetics company. Um, we do lots and lots of really cool things around cat science and especially cat health. Uh, Dr. Chris, on to you. <laughs> All right, and I am Chris Menges. Um, I'm the Chief Veterinary Officer here at Baseball Veterinary, um, and uh, just really excited to be able to, you know, bring you all of this new and, and exciting information as we push into the forefront of feline genetics. <clears throat> and uh, can you remind our listeners what this event is called? Oh, of course. This is Cats and Quarantines. Cats and Quarantines uh, is the so, <clears throat> natural name of it. And she, Anna, is, is winning the race here. I'm, I'm raising my glass because a quarantine is what we have. Uh, it's just one of the fallouts of being in quarantine is uh, um, once in a while you, you reach for a glass of, in my case, a wine. Um, it is five o'clock here in Los Angeles. What time is it over there, Chris? It's seven o'clock. Okay, and what are you drinking there at seven o'clock? Um, it's some very, very exciting water right now. <laughs> uh, I, know, I know from this, this you know, I'm making sure that I have to complete my water consumption for the day. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely, give yourself some goals. Put yourself on a routine while you're here in quarantine. Um, so um, I'm breaking all the rules. I'm having, I'm having wine um, because you know we're here at five o'clock and we're going to talk about some fun things. So mm -hmm. let's have some wine. I hope our listeners who are uh, joining us from all over the world um, are also having a little bit of wine, no matter where you are and what time it is for you. Um, so, really fun topic today. Um, we've asked our club members what they wanna talk about and Wildcat Index was something that they were really curious about. Um, we're gonna break up the next 25 minutes or so into um, a really a focus on what is Wildcat Genetics, why is it important and why does Base Boss focus on it? And we'll throw in some fun tiger facts as well. Um, and maybe also cover the recent news stories around um, COVID-19 and big cats. What's going on there? Um, we have Chris here. Chris is a veterinarian and has looked into this very, very carefully. So um, looking forward to some of your really good vetted um, expertise, Chris. Oh, perfect. Well, and I'm for that, I drink to you. I drink to Chris. Chris is an awesome veterinarian. He does a lot of really amazing work for us. I'm looking forward to hearing um, you explain the Wildcat Index to me and our listeners. Cheers. Uh -huh. well, cheers. Um, okay, well, I'll kick this off. So the Wildcat Index is the third thing that we look at in our base boss cat DNA report. We look at health markers. There's about 40 different markers that we look at. We look at cat breeds, and we're constantly looking at more and more and trying to add more breeds. And then we look at wild cats. Um, very often we get told, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Cats are related to this wild cat more than this wild cat. This can't be right. Can you explain on a high level, what does the wild cat index measure? Of course. So, you know, when we start to think about wild cats and our domestic cats, you know, we have this such this fantastic um, idea that we've got little hunters that live in our home because we see them naturally stalking their prey, whether the line in the living room, the line, sure. love that phrase. I love that phrase. And it really helps, you know, like we can see them stalking, particularly you know, either bugs or, or mice or rodents, depending on where you live, especially kind of outside um, or even birds from there. And really get successful at that. And so there's always this, this thought and idea in our mind of, of this, these, you know, small cats just being smaller versions of, of these big tigers and lions. And in many ways that, that is close to being true. You know, if we think about it, genetics, um, cats are 95.6 percent, domestic cats are 95.6 similar percent similar to our big cats. So they are extremely, extremely closely related. I mean, wow. I mean, as we as we can see just from from 
just kind of their physical appearance is there. And so it's kind of if we, our wildcat index, the way that it works and is that it's a nice comparison between our domestic cats and the big cats. Now, we know that our domestic cats aren't inherently kind of descended from those big cats. We've got lots of trees, kind of branches off that feline kind of domestic tree or the kind of domestic and wild trees from there. Um, but this is kind of like taking your cat's genetic paw print and putting it up against, say, a tiger's genetic paw print to see how much they overlap. And so just oh, I like- I love that. That makes so much sense. Uh, just like we do with gorillas um, and chimpanzees, kind of things that humans are closely related to, this is kind of our way to, to help bring that, that closer comparison, that kind of fun comparison to our, to our customers. And if we dig a little bit more into mm -hmm. that, what is Basepaws really comparing um, when we talk about a wildcat index? Why do some cat reports have a tiger or some have a cheetah? Um, as one of their top uh, one or one of their top two top wildcats? Uh, well, you know, we are comparing the kind of the genetic average and the, of those tigers themselves to the DNA that your cats, you know, that comes up from your cat sample as well. Um, and so that comparison, we do have variations within those comparisons as well um, to uh, see exactly where they are. Now, when we are thinking about this, we are doing extremely, these are all very extremely close comparisons. Um, you know, our, our cats are extremely closely related, you know, large cats are extremely closely related. So what we're doing is taking those averages that already are kind of a little bit smaller from there and using our sample to really look into those fine detailed depths in between the two of them to see kind of where yours ends up a little bit closer. Okay, okay. Um, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, it does not mean that my, uh, my Coco, my kitty, um, is closer to a lion than, for example, another kitty, or uh, is closer to a tiger than another kitty, correct? Yeah, this is all, remember um, the way that I always understood it is that, no, no, go <laughs> ahead, please. <laughs> no, I, th I think we're having a little bit of lag here on there, so I'm so sorry about that, folks, if we're seeing this, the, you know, just like we say, this is not a, a direct descendants, direct inheritance, and which one is, is closer or not. Um, but it, it is, you know, just that fun little uh, comparison to see where we all end up. And so I'd love to hear how you think of it on there as well. Um, the, the, way, the way that I always understood the wildlife, the wildcat index is that um, we, we take, so we have a very large database of cat samples in our in our database um, and we all of the cats um, from our first sample to our very last sample that we got in yesterday and even though every single cat is or the line in the exact same way when you line them up there's a tiny tiny bit of a difference so there's a little bit of ti ti more tiger and a little bit of less lion in each and every one of us I always loved the um, the example that I used to give when this company just started, we used to give the example of 23andMe. You know, 23andMe has something called a Neanderthal index. And the Neanderthal index is actually um, one of the most talked about parts of genetics from 23andMe. When they talk about the Neanderthal index, it does not mean that you, Chris, because your index is higher, um, is closer genetically or ancestry wise is closer to uh, a neanderthal than i am um it uh, it you know it it those those differences are so 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 tiny and they're within the population of 23andme samples so we are being compared to each other so yeah. if your index is let's say 150 and mine is 100 it doesn't mean that you're going to have like a bigger brow and, and i'm going to be like <laughs> let you know it doesn't mean a very serious, uh, it's not, I mean, it is serious science, but the comparison is very, very small. Would you connect, correct, correct me on, the, or do you connect with that? Oh, no, I think that's a great way to explain it on there. You know, that, that explanation really helps us kind of think about it. Remember, we are comparing between samples, between cat samples, kind of domestic cat samples. Right. Um, compare over because all of those variations are so small and right. they are direct descendant, you know, if we do have any kind of evolutionary, the evolutionary um, 
we'll say, you know, bridge that connects them back is millions upon millions upon millions of years ago. And so our domestic cats that we have nowadays are, of course, their own singular species. And, and, um, and being able to match that into the, the current wild cats as well as is that kind of comparison to see, interestingly, see where the branches changed, how they came off a little different, um, but still also the same, you know, how we have different paw sizes that, but the paw structure still has a lot of the same structures of the ways that the, the claws come out um, and claws retract and come back out from there. And um, the hunting instinct, the eyesight, we still have a lot of overlap, um, but also it's, you know, it's, it's an exciting thing to see, especially with our, our, our little ones that live in with us. Um, and, you, and you said 96%, so very, very similar. I mm -hmm. imagine, like our listeners, like imagine your cat is 96% similar to a wild cat. And what Base Paws is doing is trying to understand the differences between cat breeds. Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're de delivering reports to you that say your cat is more uh, a Russian blue than a Maine Coon. The difference between those two breeds genetically is so, so small because the difference between a cat and a wild cat is quite small too, 4%, not a lot. Um, just imagine how difficult that science is and how, how precise that science has to be to distinguish between cat breeds with just the cat itself. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, you know, so I, I think that's really cool. Uh, it's so exciting to be able to look at, you know, we, when we start to think about cat breeds, cat breeds, many of them are, are pretty young, um, and with a lot of them coming into being within about the last 50 to 75 years. And a lot of them have been bred on aesthetics or kind of those cat coat colors um, or textures, really the physical traits yeah. as opposed to kind of different physiologic traits. And that leaves our cat breeds very, very similar. And yet it's so interesting to see that how similar they are but we still have distinctions. We still have cat breeds that are predisposed to certain personalities or diseases on there and starting to look at how those small variations do occur. Um, and you know, we've never really, this is, this is so exciting because we've never really looked at what a genetic, what genetically, what does it mean to be a Russian blue? What does it mean to be right. a Russian? Um, and so these small, small I mean, a Siamese is a great example. Like, can you talk for a little bit about the Siamese? Why, why Base Buzz is struggling so much to have the Siamese be part of our report? Oh. That's a great example here. Well, the Siamese certainly doesn't want to be put in a box. Uh, we'll put it that way uh, from there. And <laughs> fine. Uh, <laughs> Despite, despite its natural, you know, many of our cats' natural tendencies to like to hide in them. This is, the Siamese breed is, is currently a first. You know, the, one of the super interesting things about the Siamese breed, as we all know, is those, uh, many people are drawn to that coat pattern, um, which is a really interesting coat. Oh, yeah. Color and point. I love it. Yes. And it's beautiful and scientifically so cool. Um, it is thermally activated. So those coat those coat colors only occur on the sections of the face that are, that are colder that allow that to happen. Um, but it's technically a form of albinism in there. And so it drew... I did not know that. That is so cool. So neat. It's such an interesting... The, the fact that, that coats can even act in that manner is just biologically amazing. Um, it's Wild. Just, um, and so, yeah, so they were brought over to the U.S. in the late 1800s because of this... Um, honestly beautiful coat and, uh, and, and have since been mixed in with a lot of Western breeds. So we have what is called the Siamese now that may have been crossed with American short hairs or even some domestic short hairs or some other, you know, Western breed. While we still also have Siamese that are called Siamese that have not had the influences from these different Western regional, Western breed regional cats and only maintain that uh, kind of classic Thai influence over there from the Siamese world. And so our Siamese are just all over the map. And so it's really interesting that it's so everywhere. So exciting to be able to define and and introduce everyone to what are those variations? How how do we learn about them and and how do we know what what clues can that give us to how they got to where they are today? I mean so many of our cats just show up from shelters. Um, and, and it's just interesting to, right. to know a little more about that mystery. Right. History. And, and 
to <laughs> to 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 just finish up on the Siamese. This has been studying the Siamese breed now for three years. We've had it as part of one of the very first breeds that were added to the report. Mm -hmm. And we've been actively looking at how the breed families have formed together. Um, on Facebook, I've posted, and I'll post again, this really great graph of how you see the clustering of of the breeds coming together this is this is what we're seeing as every new sample comes in and we're seeing the western group being clustered we see the asian groups being clustered and we see the persian groups being clustered and then we see the siamese and it's just everywhere we yeah. have a siamese here and a siamese here and, and and we just at first we didn't trust the data and then we realized that what what you know when you go to a, a, a breed show or if you go to a cat show when you see a Siamese, what you are recognizing is that color point pattern, but there's so much more to that breed than just that in initial pattern of the, of the coat. And there's so many different ways to define a Siamese genetically. Um, and to your point about, about you know, these breeds and shelters, I, um, I'm currently actually trying to uh, bring home a new kitty. Um, I've, been, I've been looking for a new kitty now for months. It's, um, I originally started with in, in February, I, I was hearing that we were going to have this, you know, these problems in the States and I wanted to adopt a kitty because I thought there'll be so many more cats in, in shelters and now it's impossible to adopt a cat. But I was going to shelters beforehand and, and any cat that has any color point, um, you know, a shelter would call it a Siamese. Of course. And yes, and it's, it's so funny because what we see genetically is you can have a Siamese without color point. You can have tons of color point cats that have nothing really to do with the Siamese except for their coat color. Um, so it's, it's just been taking us so much time and work and effort. Um, and we're hoping to add that. Guys, know we, we've been trying to add this breed forever. Hoping to add it soon. Hey, so uh, yeah, we got a little bit off Wildcats into the Siamese. Sorry, I'm Chris, I apologize. Like, like wild cats on there, uh, but it'll be so exciting to see oh, yeah. classify them. I mean, that that the excitement in there, the internally to be able to to really help define this understanding of what's become yeah. what we do is is what kind of really what we're here for. Um, listen, we have a few questions. I just want to add uh, ask a few questions. Uh, first question is: Will we be adding more wild cats to our wild cat index? Um, Katarina wants to know if there be added. <laughs> I think it's an awesome question. <laughs> so are we going to be adding more wildcats? Oh, well, that is under discussion. We are always looking to kind of add and, and make our report better on there. And so what I, you know, we are looking at sourcing some of those wildcat um, samples as well and how, how we can kind of add those and add that fun into the report. Though that timing has always been thrown off, we don't have a timeline on that. Um, I'd, I'd love to see if we have some, you know, like I said, I'd love to be able to tell you we're having some soon, but it is currently in the list, just not quite our highest priority. Unfortunately, the Siamese is kicking that, kicking that Black Panther That's right. uh, priority around right now. That's right. I would add to that the following is, um, we would love to have some wildcat samples. Um, mm -hmm. I know that um, our our scientists have talked about this before. We've actually reached out to the San Diego Zoo um, to ask for some wildcat samples. Um, you know, you guys have all heard about tigers that are living um, in the United States and big tiger farms. Um, there's, there's lots of samples to one of them. One of the focuses will be for us to get access to those samples so that we can have them be part of our own science. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, um, I wanted to, uh, to, there's one more question. Um, so I think you would love this one, Chris. Um, what about breeding domestic cats and wild cats? So when we say wild cats, we don't always mean the big cats. Mm -hmm. there, there could be smaller wild cats, wild cats that you and I are probably used to, maybe you and Texas more than me in Los Angeles, but used to seeing. Can you imagine a situation where a um, there could be a half wild or a quarter wild cat out there 
Um, because some people think their cat might be part bop cat. Um, I've really seen that question come up a lot. What do you think about that? Well, absolutely. You know, we do get that question, that bobcat question a lot. Um, also, every now and then I get a raccoon question. Um, if, if you think that uh, the spring <laughs> is a cat and a raccoon. Um, but bobcat is much more common, <laughs> more common on there. Now, uh, so for, you know, bobcats, it's really interesting to see which wild cats can actually end up breeding with domestic cats. Um, while we say that the percentages are very, very small, of course, you know, with domestic cats versus the big, big cats. We've got that, you know, 95.6% similarity. And those generally get, you know, that similar generally gets higher as the cats get smaller. Um, that's not a great rule of thumb, but it does kind of work on there. Now, as Makes that sense. gets smaller, it doesn't always mean that our domestic cats can breed with our wild cats. Um, there are actually very few kind of wild cat species that end up being able to bridge that reproductive gap. There has to be a few things that line up um, genetically, chromosomally, um, as, as well as kind of physically to make the whole process work. And it's pretty, actually pretty rare for that be able to be able to happen. Um, and typically, if those do even do happen, uh, you know, the, the, either the males, typically the males come out sterile um, as well. So it can be a bit of a process. So like, for instance, oh, wow will breed, um, you know, who's that, that very much that, that crossbreed on there, one of the more famous crossbreeds or hybrid breeds. Um, you have to do some very specific breeding patterns to even allow for those kind of cat genetics, the domestic cat genetics to take back over before the males of the species or the males of the breed can, can become viable again to, you know, reproduce for a little bit. Um, now, that being said, bobcats. I, I would love to ask a few more. Of course. Oh, yeah. No, continue, please. <laughs> I was just like, oh, oh, well, I, I wanted to ask. I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> you go first. All right. All right. That being said, bobcats have not been proven um, to have any offspring. We have never, ever seen an offspring. There's been a couple attempts, oh. uh, but but there has never been a lab or a, you know, it currently it's all just myth and folklore that it's, that it is part of Bobcat. Wow. So that is really key. So there has been no Bobcat to domestic cat uh, mix. What about, what else? So how, how often can it happen? Um, I would not be lying if I didn't say like we, we would probably get this question three to five times a month mm -hmm. uh, when someone would write to us and say, I think my cat is a mixed with a, uh, a wild cat. How mm -hmm. often does that really happen? Uh, in the wild itself? Oh, astronomically small, astronomically small. There's a, uh, all I, you know, like the, all of the cases I've seen have been very specifically created and targeted um, within Kind of a reproduced um, because it does, you know, if you if you take a, a wild cat in a wild environment, there are a lot of we'll say evolutionary and, and natural pressures that keep them worried about food supply, worried about um, kind of uh, you know, really just survival, home and survival, um, and pheromones can be yeah. They don't really bridge that gap as well, um, you know, between the cat and the wild cat. They'll be identify that as as a different species, as more of honestly more of a either a competition or a food source, uh, more than a kind of a mate source. A mate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, so just to just to wrap things up, the wild cat index um, that we offer as part of our report is a compare. Uh, within our database of how we see um, your kitty uh, and its genetics and it compares to the wildcat DNA that we have uh, for that big cat. It does, it, if it's a really high percentage, it basically means that out of all the cats in the base files database, um, your kitty has a little bit more than all of them. Um, it does not mean from that wildcat. 
very important because this comes up a lot. <laughs> and actually, this comes up so much that we have seen uh, folks leave reviews on Amazon or folks uh, write to us and say, you guys are doing terrible science by saying this. We are not saying this. We are offering you a way of comparing your kitty to the rest of our database. And Chris, what are, any more to add so that it's super duper clear uh, about how this works? Um, I think you summed it up very well. You know, I'm just going to leave again with my, my favorite example is it's like we're comparing paws. So we're taking, taking your cat's genetic paw and putting it against a tiger's genetic paw. And so it doesn't mean that that's where they came from or that's where they're specifically related to, but just which one looks just a little bit more similar um, than all of our other ones. Speaking of tigers, I'm glad you said that because I want to slightly pivot our conversation um, since we are talking about big cats right now big cats have been in the news a lot lately um for a very sad reason we've had a uh, a tiger in the bronx zoo that contracted the novel covid 19 coronavirus um we actually have just today published a blog on our page summing up everything we know about this particular coronavirus other coronaviruses uh, and cats um, we'd like to think of ourselves as a vetted source of information for this type of stuff because we have folks like Chris um, that do nothing but understand and write and can communicate with with X and communicate it back to to you guys and us. Um, so I would love to just get your thoughts on um, big cats, viruses, and maybe this particular story. Uh, you know, well, this this particular story is very interesting. As you mentioned, you know, the cat uh, did test positive for COVID, um, and they they did note that it did have some some respiratory symptoms on there, um, which is a really interesting um, really interesting case um, in in that fact because we have not seen very you know of, of any cats or animals that have tested positive. We don't typically see any signs or symptoms, um, and so this is you know, still a case that is being followed up on there. They're not quite sure um, where the cat may have, we may have gotten it from. Um, now, that being said, of course, New York is very much a hotbed of, of COVID activity right now. And so, as we know, there's a lot of asymptomatic carriers and spread that still goes along. So, you know, unfortunately, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if that was simply one of the cases that, that ended up moving from there. Um, you know, but it is, it is always something that we want to issue and watch you know it's we're, I'm really excited to see that the CDC very early on issued some great pet guidance so that if you were mm -hmm. sick you know if possible go ahead and self-isolate from your pets now that being said if you if you can't self-isolate from them um, you know we haven't even in in our domestic cats we still haven't seen any record of signs of, um, of, of actually getting sick from being you know exposed with a to a human with the virus um, and so uh, you know, of course, we don't want you to, you still, if you are, if you do uh, get sick and you don't have anyone to care for your cats, still care for your cats, take care of them. You know, we're, we're not, there's no abdication that we have to worry about a cycle at this point in time. happening. Yeah, yeah. And to you, I just want to emphasize that um, we have not heard of any domestic cats in the States that have caught the virus from their owners, which is great, great, great. Um, but we have seen it in, in this wildcat example. And um, it's just so interesting because it brings us back to something that you've known for a long time and you've told us way before this is that cats get coronaviruses. And this is something that's common. Um, can you maybe share a little bit about that um, just to calm us down that this is, this is what happens with cats? Well, you know, cats are, are very similar to humans in a, in a genetic perspective. It's not 95.6%, um, it's in the low 90 percentages. That's similarity to humans. And when we think about that, that's not just physical. It's not just how our bodies look. It also kind of goes into how our bodies function. Now, you mentioned cats get coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I do want to mention, like we always mention, is that coronavirus is actually a big family term. There are lots and lots of coronaviruses that have existed before COVID and will continue to exist afterwards. Um, and so with, with the main one that we know about in cats or, or kind of experience in cats is called feline enteric coronavirus, which can end up causing uh, FIP, 
And so this, this disease has been for a long time plaguing our cats. Now, when we think about the difference between cats and humans, you know, we do have some similarities in receptors, which um, may explain why our big cats were able to, to catch this disease in some form or fashion, or at least mm -hmm. to, to test for it from there. Um, and those, you know, so we all do have a little bit of, of big cat in us as well. Sure. <laughs> I like to think of it as, um, is it true, Chris, that cats are genetically closer to humans than any other mammals except for primates? Uh, yes. I have seen those numbers and I, um, I just think it's amazing that uh, out of all the pets out there, um, genetically, we always better than more than pigs more than more than dogs um maybe that's why we have that chris are you still oh, there sorry. hello oh yeah a little okay, bit there. Good. cut out a little bit there sorry about that i was catching oh i'm so sorry i'm so sorry oh. um yes you know that we well, are listen i don't want to have any more technical difficulties <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> Too much. There's too much Zoom in the world right now. Everyone's zooming away. It's 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 happy hour quarantine. I hope yeah. I hope they're quarantining uh, like we are. So maybe we'll wrap things up. Uh, we'll have this video posted on Facebook. Um, we will be sending it out to all of you that have questions about the Wildcat Index and why it works and how it works. Um, and I think it will be good if you have a glass of wine um, as you watch us. So Chris, thank you so much for everything. Well, thank you. Thank you okay. and cheers. Cheers. Have a great evening.